Wipe sorrow's tears away Now let me ever stray from thee aside When in lies transient dream When death cold soul and stream Shall o'er me roll Bless Savior then in love Fear and distrust remove Bear me safe above a ransomed soul <clears throat> That's the way you get it done. You just say point and move. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to give you the mic, Ed, and let you bless y'all. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the chance to be in your house this morning. Father, we thank you for uh, Pastor Chris and the message he brings and pray that you would anoint it and ha help us to have open hearts and receptive minds to what he has to say today. We ask that you would take this offering and bless it and use it to further your kingdom through our church, through our community, and throughout this area. In Jesus' name, amen. Four twenty-six. It's time for a grace group to join me in case I need to repeat for the online because I always forget to turn the mic on. <laughs> Talking is my priority, not being heard. <laughs> I heard 
morning, everyone. Okay. <clears throat> Psalm 34, 17 to 22. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of them, none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. trying to remember the schedule and who comes next and what but I think it's me again what is it oh I know but see I have to stop and then focus and then think where are we on the schedule <laughs> and then think what's next so a little bit of time taking there all right we it's time for our praise songs but as you can see we're lacking our praise team again for one more week <laughs> next week they'll be back but uh, if you will stand with me we will sing a hymnal and then get ready for our message to be brought. Page 208, love divine, all love excelling. <clears throat> Children's Church today. All right, no Children's Church. So you can be seated. My sermon today is about prayer. So I want to begin by uh, reading some prayers that I found online that were written by children. Uh, here's some things that are written by children um, about prayer. So go ahead and show that first one there, Jada. Um, Dear God, please send a new baby for mommy. The baby you sent last week cries too much. So. <laughs> She wants a new baby. Uh, dear God, who did you make smarter, boys or girls? My sister and I want to know. Uh, and it's a legitimate question, I think. I think we all want to know the answer to that one. Um, 
Angela said, dear God, could you please give my brother some brains? So far, he doesn't have any. Uh, I do wonder if God ever answered that prayer and if uh, Angela's brother ever got the brains that he does so desperately needed. Um, here's the thing. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. Uh, we may not always understand God's answer. and We may not always like the way that God answers uh, the prayer. But we, if you believe in the God of the Bible, uh, then you must also believe that he answers the prayers of his people. Dr. Helen uh, Rosevier, a missionary in Zaire, told this story. Uh, a, mother and her, uh, a, a mother at their mission, uh, at uh, Dr. Helen's mission, um, died after giving birth to a premature baby. They tried to improvise a makeshift uh, incubator to keep the infant alive, uh, even after the mother's death, but, but the only hot water bottle they had was beyond repair. So they asked the children at the orphanage to pray for the baby and for her sister. One of the girls at the orphanage immediately prayed, Dear God, please send a hot water bottle today. Um, tomorrow will be too late because by then the baby will be dead. And, and dear Lord, send a doll for the baby's, sis, uh, the baby's big sister so that she won't feel so lonely. That very afternoon, uh, a large package was uh, delivered to them from England uh, the children watched eagerly as Dr. Helen opened it. Much to their surprise, under some clothing was a hot water bottle. Um, immediately, the girl who prayed uh, started digging deeper into the package, exclaiming, if God sent that, surely he also sent a doll for his big sister. And, and she was right, because five months earlier, God had burdened a ladies' group at a church to include both of those specific, spe very specific items in their package to the mission in Zaire. That's a true story. It happened. Um, and it sounds unbelievable to our skeptical 21st century brains, but maybe that's just because we need to pray that God will give us new spiritual brains so that we would have a desire to pray and see God answer prayer. Oftentimes when we hear sermons about prayer, we feel guilty. But before you feel guilty before, because you feel like you don't pray enough or pray powerfully enough, I just want to point out that no matter how much you pray, you might always feel like you don't pray enough because the standard for prayer, according to the Bible, is that we never stop praying. So no matter how much you think you pray, uh, if you, we never pray enough. Jesus taught his disciples in Luke 18, uh, verse 1, that, they should, pray, that should, they should always pray and never give up. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray without ceasing. Um, and I'm sure that even Paul, who wrote, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, didn't literally pray every moment of the day. And yet he never once wrote that we should feel guilty or that he felt guilty for not praying enough. So I don't think the goal of these kinds of passages is to get us to feel guilty for not praying enough. But I, I do think that they challenge us to pray a certain way. James chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. James 5, 16 through 18 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it, that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth, or its fruit. Father, we confess to you that we're sinners, and we confess to one another that we're sinners, so we ask you to heal us, that we might go and bear fruit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Bearing fruit in the Bible is often used as an illustration of being productive and effective in our faith. Um, when a farmer sows his crops, he hopes and prays that the farm will bear fruit. Uh, he doesn't just want uh, to work for the sake of work. He, he wants to see a harvest. He works to see a harvest. And as Christians, we can sometimes be confused about the, the type of fruit that we're supposed to be producing. Um, Charles Ryrie, you might know his name from the Ryrie Study Bible, he writes about uh, five types of fruit that Christians ought to be producing. Uh, we can have the, the type of fruit of developing Christian character. We can have the type of fruit of uh, developing Christian conduct. 
Uh, we can have the fruit of seeing other people come to know Jesus. We can bear fruit with our lips that declare God's praise. And we can bear fruit of generous giving. It's five types of fruit that Charles Ryrie outlines. Um, boiling these down even further, though, I, I think that we can basically boil all these kinds of fruit to just two things. Uh, as Christians, we're to increase, increase in the fruit of the Spirit, and we're called to make disciples of all the nations. Increase, increase in the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Increase, increase in all those things, and also go and make disciples of all the nations. So based on just those two criteria, are you being a fruitful Christian? And if not, what do you need to do? What do you need to start doing right now, this morning, in order to begin to bear fruit? Verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, one another that you may be healed. Now, I don't know if this next story is true. I'm going to share it anyway because it has a good point. Um, there was once a small town that had historically been dry in the sense that there was no alcohol being served anywhere in town. It was a dry town. But then a, a local businessman decided to build a tavern, and, and a group of Christians uh, from a, a, a local church were concerned about it, and they, they planned an all-night prayer meeting to ask God to intervene. Um, and as the story goes, shortly after... Uh, they started their prayer meeting, uh, lightning struck the bar and it burned to the ground. Um, the owner of the bar heard about their prayer meeting and then sued the church, claiming that the prayers of the congregation were, were responsible. Uh, but the church argued as its defense that it was just a coincidence. And after reviewing the case, the presiding tr uh, the judge stated that no matter how this case comes out, one thing is clear, the tavern o owner believes in the power of prayer and Christians do not. So, do you believe that God answers prayer? We saw last week that we're to pray for one another in regards to our sicknesses and weaknesses in order to be saved. Verse 17 said last week, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. So we talked about how there's a community aspect to salvation that we often ignore. God doesn't just want to save each of us, but all of us. So we're to pray for one another that we would be saved. Um, so when we see that someone is sick, whether physically or morally or, or weak in some way, we were to pray for them that they would be saved. This week, we read in verse 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That's kind of weird, isn't it? I, I mentioned last Sunday night, uh, mentioned this last Sunday night, but, but wouldn't we expect that the outcomes of these verses would be reversed? Right, they, they seem mismatched, don't they? We'd expect to read that in order to be healed, we pray for the one who is sick. In order to be saved, we confess our sins. But that's not what it says. James writes it the other way. Uh, he writes that in order to be healed, we confess our sins. And in order to be saved, we pray for the one who is sick. That's kind of weird, isn't it? What this tells me is that it's all packaged together. Um, your salvation and healing are linked together. Now, that sounds like something that a prosperity gospel preacher might say. So let me clarify that a little bit. When you come to trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you can also know that you will be healed of every sickness and weakness, whether in this life or ultimately in the life to come. In eternity, when God makes all things new. See, God doesn't always promise to heal every sickness in this life but he does promise to heal every sickness in the life to come. Sometimes prosperity preachers get that mixed up. They think that God wants to heal everything here. Well, you, here, here's, a, here's, a, here's a reality that sometimes they forget. Even when, God, even when Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus still eventually died. So not every sickness can be healed in this life. We, we will still all die, and yet in eternity... God will heal every suffering, every pain, every tear will be wiped away. Scripture is clear that this will only come about as we confess our sins to God and to one another. We're also very good at confessing to one another that the fact that we're sinners, but we're often very poor at confessing our sins. We're comfortable telling each other the general truth 
that we all know that, that we're sinners, but we're very uncomfortable sharing how specifically we've sinned. And when we usually do, we usually do it in a dismissive or even slightly humorous way, like when I confess to you that I'm addicted to pizza rolls. I've never told anyone this. Um, but, but sometimes I feel guilty for how many pizza rolls I eat. I'm being totally serious. This is not me joking. Sometimes late at night, even when I haven't even been hungry, uh, I get myself 25 to 30 pizza rolls, almost a whole bag of them, and just eat them all. Um, so please pray for me. I'm, I'm, I'm being totally serious. This is not me joking. Um, pray for me that I would have a healthy relationship with food. Now, some of you may be thinking, that's no big deal, Pastor Chris. Um, that sm sounds like a very small thing. Uh, at least you don't struggle with my sin, Pastor Chris. But that's exactly my point. We all tend to look at our own sin at times and either excuse it as no big deal or think it's the worst sin of all. But James encourages us to confess it to one another. So just so you don't think I'm, I'm once again doing the same thing we always do by minimizing my sin or pointing out a, a sin that's so, so small in everybody's eyes, I, I not only struggle with eating pizza rolls and other kinds of things, but as with gluttony as a whole. Uh, and I struggle with egotism and greed. I struggle with indulging in the things of this world that, that matter nothing for eternity. I struggle with sin. So please pray for me that I would be healed. Now, I don't want you to worry right now. I'm not going to pick on anybody else and have you confess your sins to each other. Uh, that would be an interesting time of ser sermon and confession. Um, I, but I simply want you to think about this. The next time you're tempted to dismiss your sin as no big deal, ask for prayer instead. Because prayer is powerful. But I want you to know something else. Um, in, in addition to telling us to pray for one another, Scripture is clear that the prayer of a righteous person is even more powerful. Uh, look at the second part of verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. The Bible names several reasons throughout its pages why our prayers might not be answered the way that we want. It, it could be because we, were, um, we, we don't believe God will answer the prayer. We, we doubt him. It could be because we pray with wrong motives. Sometimes it's because we don't even pray. We, ha we have not because we ask not. But, but here, James alludes to how sometimes our prayers aren't answered the way that we want because we simply haven't been living righteous lives. I think Tim Hawkins said it best. I love this one over food. Sometimes we pray over food and ask God to make up for our bad choices when we eat. That's funny. <laughs> no matter what it is, Lord, bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. Lord, bless this bag of Cheetos. <laughs> and this jumbo Dr. Pepper, Lord. Somehow make this nourish us in some way. I don't know how you're going to do it, Father, but we just trust in you now. <laughs> Father, change the molecular structure of this food. Change the Cheeto into a carrot stick on the way down. Amen. Spirit of low carb, rain down on me now! I pray a hedge of protection around my pancreas, Lord. Right now! intervene it's kind of silly how we pray sometimes isn't it we pray over our food even while we're eating unhealthy foods we pray for healing when we keep on abusing ourselves we pray for circumstances in our lives to change and then keep on perpetuating those same circumstances and it's true that god can do the miraculous but it's also true that God wants us to take a step of faith in order to believe that he's going to do the miraculous in us. But of course, ultimately, none of us can live righteous lives. We're sinners. So how can we expect God to hear from us at all when it's the prayer of a righteous person that God hears? Well, well let's look at an example of when God did hear someone. Verse 17, Elijah 
was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So Elijah is given as an example. Elijah is a great example of a man of faith in the Bible. He followed God. He spoke what God wanted him to speak. He did what God wanted him to do. And and when he prayed, God answered his prayer. And yet it says in verse 17 that Elijah had a nature like ours. In other words, he's not a righteous person either. Elijah is a sinner just like us. You see, the only way that God hears any of our prayers is because of God's grace. I think Elijah is being given as an example of a righteous person so that we can better understand God's grace. A righteous person doesn't become righteous by their own efforts, but but through God's grace. See, Jesus is the only truly righteous person. He never sinned, not even once. And he's interceding for you in heaven right now. He's praying for you right now that you would be strengthened and healed and forgiven of your sins. From the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. You see, I think just as Elijah prayed for the rain so that the earth produced fruit, Jesus prays for us so that we might produce fruit. And he calls us to fervently pray for one another, joining him in his work so that we might all be healed. So here's what I want to challenge you with this morning. I challenge you to pray. Not because you feel guilty because you haven't prayed enough, but because you see that God answers prayer. Pray that God would heal you and heal your neighbor. Pray that God would help you and your neighbor through your circumstances. Pray that God would forgive you and your family, and your neighbor for whatever sins you've committed. And then, believe that he does. You don't have to doubt him. His goodness and grace isn't based on what you've done, but based on what Jesus has done. Believe that he hears and answers prayer, not because of how righteous you are, but because of how righteous Jesus is. Believe it because God is good and God answers prayer, especially the prayer of the righteous one. See, Jesus is the righteous one. And through his death on the cross, we are made righteous by grace through faith. If you've never trusted in Jesus, the righteous one who died on your behalf, the unrighteous, I pray that this morning you would trust in him. Take a step of faith. Follow him in obedience, in baptism. and uh, Be be made righteous, not by your own efforts, because we can't make ourselves righteous, but through what Jesus did for you on the cross. Let's stand together. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior, I invite you this morning to come and trust in him. We're going to sing a song. Uh, Page 277. Page 277 in your hymnal. Um, But if you need to know Jesus, then instead of singing, just come forward. Uh, I'd love to pray with you, invite you to know Jesus as your Savior. Uh, 277, let's sing together. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love, at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing Always only for thy King Always only for my King Let's uh, close today in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Uh, God, thank you so much for your great love. 
Thank you that we can come and know that you hear our prayers, not based on what we've done, but based on what Jesus, our righteous Savior, has done. God, I pray that we would be people of prayer. You've called us to be people of prayer, not to earn anything for ourselves, but simply out of resting and rejoicing in what, in what Jesus has done for us. And we do pray for our friends, our family, our neighbors, that they would come to know Christ as well. We pray that they would confess their sins to you and trust in Jesus. Help us to be ministers this week. Help us to reach out to them, reach out with the gospel, that they might see your goodness, rejoice in your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.